Education can be thought of as the transmission of the values and accumulated knowledge of a society. In this sense, it is equivalent to what social scientists term socialization or acculturation. If we want to understand why standard schools are what they are, we have to abandon the idea that they are products of logical necessity or scientific insight. They are instead products of history. Schooling as it exists today only makes sense if we view it from a historical perspective. Education is a gradual process which brings positive changes in human life and behavior. We can also define education as a process of acquiring knowledge through study or imparting the knowledge by way of instructions or some other practical procedure. In the beginning, for hundreds of thousands of years, children educated themselves through self-directed play and exploration. In the 19th and 20th centuries, public schooling gradually evolved toward what we all recognize today as conventional schooling. The methods of discipline became more humane, or at least less corporal. The lessons became more secular. The curriculum expanded as knowledge expanded to include an ever-growing list of subjects and the number of hours, days, and years of compulsory schooling increased continuously. Education is a passage to progress. So education is fundamentally learning of abilities and ideas that can make us increasingly innovative and issue solver. Education is to pick up the capacity to develop and take care of issues in order to achieve their lawful motives. Education also means helping people to learn how to do things and encouraging them to think about what they learn. Long before the Europeans arrived, education had been part of Nigerians. The children were taught about their culture, social activities, survival skills and work. Most of these education processes were impacted into the children informally. A few of these societies gave a more formal teaching of the society and culture. In these societies, there are more formal instructions that govern the rites of passage from youth into adulthood. The youth is expected to have attained the necessary social and survival skills, as well as having a grounded knowledge in the culture. These are the foundations of education in Nigeria and upon them where the Western education implemented upon. European education was introduced into Nigeria in the 1840s. It began in Lagos, Calabar and other coastal cities. In a few decades, schooling in English language gradually took root in Nigeria. During the colonial years, Great Britain did not promote education. The schools were set up and operated by Christian missionaries. The British colonial government only funded a few schools. The policy of the government was to give grant to mission schools rather than expand the systems. In the northern part of Nigeria, which was predominantly Muslim populated, Western style education was prohibited. The religious leaders did not want the missionaries interfering with Islam. This gave way to establishing Islamic school that focused primarily on the Islamic education. That is going to take a lot of history. Um, looking at the educational sector in Nigeria, it has gone through very muddy waters, but I think we are gaining a headway uh, recently. The, from the colonial era, uh, when the colonial masters came into 
Nigeria from the 19th century, that's from early 1800s, you see that the colonial masters didn't just come to overthrow, they actually came to give us a new sense of purpose. As they came with their weapons to overthrow, they also came with their Bibles, they also came with education, they also came with medicine, uh, which in many ways has helped Nigeria uh, to the level where it is now. Um, but the form of training that we had before, the form of education that we had before, was more of uh, indigenous um, learning, which has to do with different communities being able to focus on their own community to train their children uh, in the right precepts, in terms of morality, in terms of physical growth, intellectual growth. Of course, most people back then had to just focus on farming uh, or whatever it is that their fathers were doing. They are able to focus on you know, that family value following the footsteps of their parents or close relatives. If you don't have a family, a father or a mother, you have close relatives that you're able to train um, under them. Someone like my father, um, even though he lost his own father at a very early age, his uncle uh, trained him, uh, he learned uh, carpentry and that helped him in the early stages of his life. Um, so that's what we had when the colonial masters came in. Of course, there was a more formal um, training or learning which has to do with um, systematic um, essential knowledge. Being able to sit down in a classroom, you learn from a lecturer, a teacher, who trains, teaches you for a few hours, you go back home. Um, so the formal training actually began around the middle of uh, the 1800s. You see that that formal teaching now became our format. You write examination, you go to classroom, you learn certain um, ideologies, you come to law, engineering, medicine, and, and what have you. So it is true, these colonial masters that were able to train, were able to learn um, in that kind of system. For um, most parts of Western Nigeria, you see that this thing became easy or should I say southern Nigeria, it was easy for the missionaries to, to influence their own form of teaching. But for northern Nigeria, where they already had some Islamic learning, you see that it was more of a religious uh, understanding. They would teach them Arabic, teach them uh, Islamic laws and, and what have you. Um, so the missionaries did not have so much influence in northern Nigeria, even though it was a gradual process. But CMS mission, the Methodist mission, they were able to influence um, southern Nigeria. And if you even look at uh, the level of edu education now, it is actually southern Nigeria that has more schools. You have more universities, you have more um, tertiary, you know, tertiary institutions, secondary school, and so on and so forth, because they had more influence through their missionary activities. Most of the schools started as missionary um, endeavors in those early times. The, the formal um, education when we now took over independence from 1960 um, actually began from 1950 to about 1980. That is when we actually tried to have a, a formal education by Nigerians. Um, you see that it's in that period you hear about the free education. It's in that same period you hear that um, schools were multiplying. We had more students. Even the, the government itself was able to put more budget into education, about 40%, which was very high compared to what you have now, which we'll still look at that later on. Um, so you see that education from the colonial era, though it was formal, it helped to shape uh, educational sector to what it is now. Um, even though we have not really developed from that level, from the, the way it really started on a very high level, very skyrocketed, we had so much uh, money devoted to education, and students were made to go to school. Uh, unlike what you have now, even though they claim it is <laughs> still free, but you don't see uh, that part of being, it being compulsory anymore. People, you see all kinds of students everywhere, children roaming the streets, children begging for food. The poverty line has, has increased, and it's because education doesn't seem to be compulsory anymore. In, in many parts of uh, northern Nigeria, of course, with the whole influx of uh, terrorism and Boko Haram that are against Western education, children no longer, no longer feel the need to go to school. So you have millions of children, tens of millions of children out there on the roads because 
we did not maintain the momentum at which education was, uh, was, was really taken seriously from the colonial era. And then if you also look at it from that early times uh, when the colonial masters were here, you see that comprehensive learning was also very important. People were able to focus on the physical, intellectual, social, and vocational aspect of their living. You hardly hear of unemployment because people have been trained. They know what they need to do out there in society. Even though it wasn't as um, progressive as we used to have it with our indigenous training, you know, from an early stage, you know how to do farming, you know how to do carpentry, you know how to do many of these things. Colonial masters helped us to have that formal training. So what we should be looking at now is a balance. As you have the formal training, you also have the other aspect of progressive learning where you actually have hands-on, practical approaches to meeting uh, the needs in our society. Because with the rate of unemployment you find now, you see that students go to schools, but they don't know what to do. They don't have the, the knowledge how to be practical, how to address issues. They only go for the head knowledge. With what the colonial masters gave us, it was more of head knowledge. You just learn certain things. But even now that we have missed out on that, we, we don't have the head knowledge. We also don't have the practical uh, wherewithal to handle situations. So we are now at a loss. Later on, of course, we'll still, I'll still mention some of the difficulties that we're facing with uh, educational sector now. But from the colonial time, they have helped us with formal education. They've helped us to understand um, certain basic uh, understandings of knowledge that is able to propel us for this next generation. Formal education or formal learning usually takes place in the premises of the school, where a person may learn basic, academic or trade skills. Small children often attend a nursery or kindergarten, but often formal education begins in the elementary school and continues with secondary school. Post-secondary education or higher education is usually at a college or university which may grant an academic degree. It is associated with a specific or stage and is provided under a certain set of rules and regulations. The formal education is given by specially qualified teachers. They are supposed to be efficient in the art of instruction. It also observes strict discipline. The student and teacher both are aware of the facts and engage themselves in the process of education. Informal education is when you are not studying in a school and do not use any particular learning method. In this type of education, conscious efforts are not involved. It is neither pre-planned nor deliberate. It may be learned at some marketplace, hotel or at home. Informal education may be a parent teaching a child how to prepare a meal or ride a bicycle. People can also get an informal education by reading many books from a library or educational websites. Unlike formal education, informal education is not imparted by an institution such as school or college. Informal education is not given according to any fixed timetable. There is no set curriculum required. Informal education consists of experiences and actually living in the family or community. Non-formal education includes adult basic education, adult literacy education, or school equivalency preparation. In non-formal education, someone who is not in school can learn literacy, other basic skills or job skills, home education, individualized instruction, such as programmed learning, distance learning, and computer-assisted instruction or other possibilities. Non-formal education is imparted consciously and deliberately and systematically implemented. It should be organized for a homogeneous group. Non-formal education should be programmed to serve the needs of the identified group. This will necessitate flexibility 
in the design of the curriculum and the scheme of evaluation. Um, when it comes to the, uh, the management, in other words, how the Konina Masters were able to manage it then and also how we are managing it now. Like I said, the Colonial Masters, of course, with missionary schools, it was, it was a regimented system. You go to school, you have certain hours. Many times, in fact, in most of the cases, you see that it was boarding schools that we had then. I also passed through a boarding school myself. So it was, it was a systematic approach. People knew what they went to school to do, what they went to school to achieve. And you're able to focus on that, you know. But what we have now, um, is that the government has lost out. They don't know how to focus attention on that. We focus more attention on other things, our industries, oil and gas, on power, even though all of those things also have their limitations. You don't see so much effort being put into it. You might hear that the budget for this year is in trillions of, of, of naira, sometimes even in dollars, but how much of that is being implemented is another issue. The, one of the major issues that we find now in, in our own generation is that from the basic level, attention has not been given. The same way these schools have existed from the 80s is still the way they are. They are many of them are shattered, dilapidated, even almost non-existent. Bushes have surrounded most of them. So education now seems to be just the glory of the past. We don't, we don't seem to focus so much attention on that anymore. The discipline that uh, we used to have from missionary uh, schools is no longer there. That is why you find cultism. That is why you find uh, thuggery. You find all kinds of robbery. You find all kinds of corruption because no more attention is being paid. If you look at the way students uh, dress nowadays, you wonder if this one is actually going to school. The facilities in, in schools are nothing to write home about. Lack of chairs, lack of facilities. Even the teachers that have been trained don't have any motivation whatsoever. That's why you always hear of strike almost every year. There's, there's no much attention being paid to the educational sector. So it is my hope that through conversations like this that the government will be able to look inward and say, what is the future of our nation? If we're not able to focus on education, then what will be the future of our children? If nowadays people graduate and can't, can't even spell their name, can't even speak a proper grammar, you now wonder, are these the ones that are going to be leaders tomorrow? And you even see that even on television, by the time you see some of our so-called leaders, they can't even have a straightforward conversation or interview. They will rather exert their power and authority on others, but when it comes to conversation, when it comes to debate, none of them uh, can, can stand out in front. So. The comparison is just very glaring. It's very glaring that what we had before was only a glory. I mean, what we had before was glorious, was good. We have many people who can stand out in society, stand out even internationally. But now, graduates hardly uh, can even st uh, stand in front of a television to even say uh, a few comments or even to stand in international um, um, uh, levels. So the level of malpractices that we find, the level of corruption has so permeated our educational sector, even teachers are frustrated and no much attention is being paid to the educational sector. The challenges facing education and educational system in Nigeria is very huge. Uh, when I think back, when I graduated, my final year project was on the systems of education over time in Nigeria. I was looking at the 6334. What were, what were the challenges? Uh, for one, if you look at it at the bigger level, I was a victim of a poor educational policy in 1994 as a graduate. There was this time uh, there was a policy on cumulative uh, assessment. There was massive failure. Like I said, uh, combined uh, uh, honors, only four of us graduated out of numerous uh, number of students, over 100 students. You cannot even just say it was poor. It was just a complete disaster. 
1994. Then if you go back again, looking at where we are at present, look at 1994 and look at now. When we're supposed to be having improvement, we are not seeing significant improvement. Let me look at it generally. If you talk about issue of infrastructure, it is not there. Basic infrastructures. If you talk about qualified teachers, we don't also have it. Then if you want to also look at it by region, let me take the Middle Belt region, for example. As a result of the farmer had a relations that is not very smooth, you find that most of this time, students are out of school. The case of Chibo girls, Dapchit girls, you saw what happened there. How many parents who have the confidence to even put girls in school? So it's a big challenge for us. Then if we talk about the South-South, we've been told by statistics, many boys are not in school, it's the girls that are in school. And you know what happens? When girls are more educated than boys, in terms of marriage, in terms of engagement, different kind of engagement, it's a big challenge. Then when you talk about the North, it's complete disaster because of the devastation. And the rebuilding of the Northeast is very slow. If you want to talk of the Southwest, yes, there there is parity between male and females and ahead of many other parts of the country for so many obvious reasons. They've developed missionaries were there, but there's no reason why we shouldn't catch up with them. If you come to South South, because of the long the historical deprivation and the less attention that has been paid to that region. They are still very backward, both boys and girls. So generally, if you look at everywhere in the country, all the regions of the country, none is really doing outstandingly well. What is my solution? Because we don't have to be talking about challenges. I don't talk about uh, what good can come out of it. I believe in education for life. Because for me, if you want to talk about engagement, governance, leadership, self-sufficiency, empowerment is a superstructure on it which all other structures will be built. Is it politics? Is it economy? It's a good entry point. So why don't we pay attention to that? Why don't we develop the curriculum so that it's so rich that it will empower anybody that has come in contact with it to the extent that you don't have to rely on white collar job. You'll be equipped naturally school would have gone through you and you've gone through school and you are empowered to be self-sufficient we've not been able to see that even the incidences of rape you find that the educational system has bred several liabilities to the extent that even for just a plate of food you find people demanding for sex the demand for sex is too much on both sides especially the women the demand on women is so much putting moral pressure on all of them. So generally, realize that we will not put sufficient attention to educational institutions. And not just even government alone. Government is not helping matter by taking over the, uh, the, 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 the faith-based schools. That is the Christian school and the Islamic school, particularly the Christian school, because they are more in number. If government will only return those schools and su support them with some subvention and some other uh, uh, enhancement opportunities so that the, the school system is strong. You have a strong curriculum, you have curriculum. You also have strong infrastructures, good infrastructures to support them. Now this education is global to the extent that if you are coming from Africa, and you are coming from Asia or coming from the Americas, you should be able to compete. And what is the basis? This little thing you see here, the computer. So in this computer age, if you don't have basic infrastructures, it means you have made your citizens to be vulnerable in the first instance. So there are little things we can do, little action, budgetary allocation, that can put us at par with any citizen of the world. But Nigerians are damn good people. If only we encourage them to have good education, pay attention to teachers, motivate teachers in other countries, teachers, end well and they have good fortune in terms of the investment in their training, in their welfare, as well as even when they retire so that they can still give back while in retirement. So in totality, we can do so much to be able to do well and it will not cost too much to do. I say too much because we have resources. 
we have corporate Nigerians, we have individuals that can contribute to building our educational system to the level we want globally so that we'll be able to come. Because we talk about globally because it's a global village and we mix with other citizens from other countries. So we don't need to limit ourselves. It's just for us to upgrade and get to where we need to be so that Nigeria will be a better country. Talk of leadership, well-educated, enlightened, and civilized citizens, people who have high moral standards coming from the kind of quality education they receive. So education is a big deal in terms of nation building and national development, in terms of investment in citizens. You invest, you get good investment on returns. So it gives you value for whatever investment you make. So I encourage governments, individual, faith-based organizations and groups, and other NGOs and international organizations to invest sufficiently in education because it is a superstructure on which all other structures are built. schools have affected a lot of students in various ways like the introduction of online lectures due to the closure of schools because of COVID-19 most schools have engaged on online lectures using various platforms to lecture their students my school for instance uses whatsapp to lecture their students before the introduction of what DLMS does all our students have phone to whatsapp you don't have good phone to whatsapp is there a good phone? Even if those that even have phone, do they have money to be subbing their phone regularly? Have a light. Do we have stable lights to be charging the phone? Because through the introduction of DLMLs, we observe that there are fixed terms for lecture. And once it is fixed time for lecture, everybody are also hold their phone and come online for the lectures. We have some cases that because of uh, lack of uh, no light our phones can be off from sometimes two days now supposing you are having lecture for those two days how then do you attend those classes how then do you attend it automatically you have missed the class now how about stable network is there stable network there's a no stable network there are sometimes that we try to log in and it's going to be showing us a network error we try again sometimes if the lecturer observes such things what you do is you cancel the class for that day automatically no class for you that day and it has been going on severally severally they have done it a lot so this introduction of online lecture hasn't been so helpful even talking about understanding it mostly don't understand this online lecture because they they, they kind of want the face-to-face -face interaction in class they want you to be talking to them while they are seeing you so that they can throw you questions and answer Let's talk about the last friend that has been paid and we are not staying inside. Get me right. No, no landlord will tell you that, okay, simply because we are not around for so-so period of time, so-so period of month, I won't count that when I'm doing the house rent. No. They will assume that your time started counting from the very first time you paid you the, the money, which means the house rent is just going. It's wasting. Zappolin. Now, the most painful part of it all, the one that is so painful that I can't bear, I need to pour this out, is the delay in graduation. Most of us now, we are supposed to have been graduates by now. And maybe using our time and doing some other programs that we want to do, maybe before we go for other things like service. But because we are yet to graduate and some opportunities that have been coming, we will actually miss it because we have actually not graduated yet. So it's so too painful that we are still waiting for the government to do something about it. COVID-19 has exposed the education divide in Nigeria. A UNICEF report states that 10.5 million of the country's children aged 5 to 14 years are not in school. Only 61% of 6 to 11 years olds regularly attend primary school. Some states in the northeast and northwest of the country have more than half of the girls not enrolled in schools, as marginalization ensures that girls 
are deprived of basic education. A struggle was going on prior to COVID-19 to ensure young children stay in school and have access to proper education. As Nigeria contributes approximately 20% of the total global out-of-school population. The COVID-19 pandemic is revolutionizing digital and online education globally. But kids in rural and underserved communities in Nigeria are being left behind as they are not equipped to adapt or transition to the new methods of learning. On 19th March 2020, the Federal Ministry of Education approved school closures as a response to the pandemic. States in the Federation contextualized this. The pandemic has unmasked substantial inequities in the education sector. Private and non-governmental sectors are tirelessly working to salvage this situation. However, one major issue that may stem from this inequality is that these kids who currently cannot keep up with their peers because of inaccessibility to digital tools may never catch up and will continue to feel the effect of this gap long after the pandemic is over. Inaccessibility to digital tools means many children cannot follow the curriculum online during the coronavirus crisis. Children in rural and underserved communities in Nigeria are being left behind as they are not equipped to adapt or transition to new methods of learning. This may result in a severely diminishing pool of young adults who have not garnered the necessary skills to stay ahead in the future. With Nigeria already behind in preparing its young people for the workplace of the future, the effects of the pandemic further exacerbate this issue. Voucher schools may also aid in rapidly improving the education system in Nigeria. Addressing the need for more information on the private education sector there. Given that private schools are the lead education provider in the states. Voucher schools are schools chosen by students and to which the government provides funding. There may be government or non-government providers or both, depending on the system. Government aid is needed in terms of investing in educational tools of the future alongside the total revamp of the educational sector. Reforms in the national curriculum post-pandemic will be an effective way to bridge the gap in inequality. Priorities should include the introduction of courses such as coding and robotics which can usher students into the era of the fourth industrial revolution and prepare them for jobs of the future. In countries such as Nigeria, education should be viewed as a high government priority. Help in increasing awareness of the present need for the country's children to be educated, especially those from low-income families, will benefit the country's economy in years to come. Aid provided in this direction can be viewed as an investment in human capital. The more educated the country is, the more productive. Of all sustainable missions, surely the most pressing is to improve lives. And there's no better way to do so than proper and sound education for all. Yes, I, I believe so. Um, even, like I said, <laughs> it's not too much attention is being paid to the educational sector. Uh, but in this year, 2020, and earlier this year, when uh, the COVID-19 happened, it really helped schools or educational sector to uh, think outside the box. We're able to do things we never thought was possible. Even people in industries and in companies, they look for alternatives to be able to uh, still be productive in spite of the lockdown. So I think that COVID-19 was really help, helpful to rethink, to see what new ways, what new modalities can we put up to help our students to still uh, be conversant with uh, the education. 
uh, even I myself I had several online classes during this lockdown. I was still able to converse with people. So I think that has opened the door for us to be able to realize we can actually still do these things. E-learning in many ways helps uh, open and broaden our mindset beyond the traditional system of one man just standing in front of hundreds of students, just dictating notes and writing on chalkboards and so on and so forth. With e-learning, it creates room for interaction. It creates room for creativity. It bridges the gap for, of, for information. What you not easily have accessible to students with e-learning, it becomes accessible. You can pass information online, you can pass notes, pass assignments, pass projects, and so on and so forth. And students can easily interact with that. Because, mind you, children are already on their, on their laptops and on their iPads and their phones. So why not give them education through those means? Instead of playing games and waste, whiling away time or making phone calls or being on WhatsApp and Facebook, they can actually implement ways that they can actually learn through these means. So not so that it won't just be a waste. Um, teachers will now be seen as guides. They're now uh, able to uh, um, lecture their children, be their guide, be their supervisors, so that it now helps the students to be engaging directly with the work that they have. Because before what we had was just a man standing in front of them dictating notes. The textbooks are not available. Uh, even if they are available, they are very high prices. You know? So uh, those means of education, the that traditional means, is, is no longer useful in this 20, 21st century. If you have things online, it's better this information is being passed across to them, which now creates opportunities for several students to actually understand the, the ICT, they're able to understand these things already that has been placed in front of them and they make use of it very well. If you look at um, the way people learn skills, many of these things have been made available online already. YouTube has almost videos of almost anything, how to do things by yourself. With e-learning, it helps students to actually learn things by themselves. They are able to engage with these things directly. It won't just be based on what someone gives them in class. So I hope that with e-learning, um, people will be able to develop these things in schools. From primary level, secondary, tertiary, it doesn't matter what level. The more you develop in it, it becomes easier. We just hope that even government schools and many of these other places are able to do it. But I think for private institutions, these things are already in line, they're already in place. But for government, we don't know what's really happening. <music> With what we have on ground now, uh, okay, let's even start from lack of funding. If basic amenities have not been provided then how do we now graduate to um, more, uh, more, more pertinent things in our, in our schools? Look at the, the, the budget uh, for last year um, for, for education. The UNESCO says that the standard for um, budgeting for education should be about 15 to 20%. In Nigeria, we only have 6%. Other countries like Ghana, they have think about 20%. They, they met up with that requirement for the past 10 years, if not more. They have been keeping to that standard. But in Nigeria, with all the millions and billions, if I even trillions that we have, just 6%, sometimes 7%, according to the government, they say they are even improving. But those monies that, are being, that should be expended for the educational sector, does it actually get to the grassroots? Does it actually get to the people who need it? Does it get to the teachers? Does it get to the schools? If it gets to them, how come we're not seeing the changes? So these monies are there. Even the 6% doesn't even get to them. If they now want to increase it, to say, okay, now that we want to start e-learning, will it actually get to them? There's so much corruption in the system that doesn't allow for change. Even though this same government claims that, yes, they had government of change, but you don't actually see this change. Just simple thing as funding isn't there. How would they get to that level? That is why you have so many private institutions. Private schools, many churches, independent churches, Pentecostal churches, everyone has their own school now because they know the system out there is not working. If the government was actually doing what it's supposed to do, then all these people would not be having their own privately funded uh, institutions. 
women just wake up and say, okay, this is our own, this is our own calling. This is the thing we want to do, and they develop little places where they can teach children primary level and so on and so forth. So lack of funding is one of the major limitations to uh, e-learning in our own uh, in Nigeria. Infrastructure is also another thing. If you're going to have the infrastructure, you don't have the money to even build it in the first place. So the infrastructure that is already existing is already destroyed, is already dilapidated. Corruption, I already mentioned that the money does not get to the appropriate people. Even when it, it gets to their own level, it is also misappropriated. Lecturer who has not seen money for several years or several months, if he sees a little money, of course, he's going to corner it to himself. Teachers are the ones begging students for little money. They will have notebooks, they will have uh, 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 articles that they will write, or they have assignments that they do. It is through students they get money back. Bribery and all of these things are there. Exam practices, even among students, is also very rampant. You hear many times that, oh, JAM has cancelled all the results. They have cancelled this place, they have cancelled that place because there's so much malpractice. So the system is so corrupted already. But I feel that at least with what we are seeing from private institutions, gradually maybe we will learn, we will get to understand that, though they are more expensive, but at least we will be able to learn that, see that we actually have opportunities already around us. But if it's going to be based on the government, I feel it's almost a lost cause. Even uh, teacher's welfare, already talked about that, teacher's welfare isn't uh, helpful in any way. No teaching aids, you don't have teaching aids, you don't have the, the cameras, you don't have the, the facilities to actually go about the e-learning. And then, of course, if they don't also have content, the curriculum, what does the curriculum actually teach the student? Is it impactful for students to be able to stand out tomorrow to become self-reliant? Or do they just study those things in order just to pass examination? Are those things actually impactful? So with some of these limitations, it's very hard to say um, e-learning will, will be able to adapt to it. But I think with what we see in private institutions, gradually we might be able to learn to say we actually have a little influence, even just a little percentage, but at least that will be a point of influence and change for Nigeria of tomorrow. Now, if you also look at the, the, the power sector, <laughs> that has also failed in many ways. These are the part of the, uh, the industry that will actually influence the educational sector. You don't have power. Many people depend on gen gen generators. They, all of these things are limitations to the growth of the educational sector. If you also look at even the networking industries that we have, uh, many of them are so terrible. Sometimes you're trying to connect with people internationally, trying to connect people with other parts of the country, and they're all bad. Sometimes you see many Nigerians have more than one network because one is not reliable. If one fails, you have to look at the other one. If that one fails, you have to look at an, uh, another alternative. So even networking is so bad. We hope that our institutions and our, our governments were able to look into some of these basic things. They are just very basic things that other countries are enjoying. In Ghana, they are celebrating years of uninterrupted power supply. And somehow, it's even Nigeria that even helps Ghana and many of these other countries. And you now wonder, is it because we are so populated? Is it because we have so many people? There are other countries that have millions of people there, and these things are functioning. Why is Nigeria different? It still boils down to corruption. We hope that if people see the need for this thing, think about the future, think about their children. So-called politicians, they send their children out there to other nations because they know the problems here. Instead of us to face the problem that, that, that we, are, we encounter here in Nigeria, address these issues, even if it's just year by year. It might not solve all the problem, but at least gradually we can say that, okay, this is year 2020, what is our vision for the next five years? And work towards that. We hope that with some of these things, we we'll actually see uh, the necessary change that we hope and pray for. Yes, my advice to the government will be to concentrate more efforts in the educational sector when it comes to their budgeting. It's not just about the money that they give, it's about implementing it. You might say, ah, we have given 600 billion, we have given 700 billion to educational, educational sector, but how much of that is being implemented? The commissioners for education and uh, governors and all these people, do they actually find ways to implement these things to make a change? You know, if funding is taken good care of, I think necessary change will be developing year after year. The welfare of the lecturers are also very, very important, the teachers. 
these are the future of uh, these are people who are teaching the future generations i do not know if one is going to take a statistics of uh, the number of children that we have and ask them just by question and answer how many of them want to be teachers you hardly hear that you hear oh i want to be a doctor i want to be a lawyer i want to be that because the level of of teachers and uh, lecturers are, are, are very low what they have been paid very very low if at all they haven't been paid so the welfare and what we give um, our, our teachers and lecturers should be looked into if they are given something really good because they are the ones teaching the future. The so-called politicians, who are they teaching? Nobody. But they are gaining so much, they are gaining money in the millions. If half of that or even a quarter of that is given to teachers, I think that will make a real change. And then the issue of uh, infrastructure. If what we see in many of our states, universities, uh, uh, secondary schools is what we have now, we have no future. If such infrastructure is being changed, you hear of government, certain state governments saying that they have a new school, they have a new school. How about the old ones that are there? What have they done to it? Have they refurbished it? Have they looked for ways to make sure that such infrastructure is being developed? So if funding is being taken care of, our teachers have been taken care of, the infrastructure on ground is being taken care of, I think that will be a step in the right direction. And lastly, if you look at uh, the curriculum also, the, there's, there's, there doesn't seem to be any change. There's no creativity in our curriculum. The same things we've been using since the 80s is still the same thing we're even using to now. There's no change, there's no creativity, there's no room for improvement. It's just garbage in, garbage out. As teachers come to uh, teach their students, it's the same thing they give back to them, even if they are able to give it back to them. So you see that even the curriculum needs to be changed. If you look at what other people are doing in private institutions, they look at what the British system has been using. They have changed it over time. American system has changed it. They keep changing every time. But our own still remains the same thing. And that is why you see so much exam malpractices. If we're actually able to develop and change our curriculum, you see that there's creativity, there's new engagement, there's fresh mindset, and Nigeria would definitely be the better for it.